I obviously think the rule is a good rule and it's appropriate and it was crafted in a careful manner so that some of the things that people say it does, in fact, it doesn't do. I think the White House is clear in their intent, this executive order, which to some extent these executive orders are almost becoming like press releases or campaign promises. It was pretty clear from the intent of the executive order and it was very clear from Mr. Cohen's comments on Friday, which I quite frankly didn't understand because the premise of his comments were that uh, the fiduciary rule doesn't allow choices. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. And then he went on to say that the only way people can create wealth is through lots of choices. So, you know, I think they're missing the point on what this rule does, but it's clear they have an intent to unwind well, this rule any way they can. Congressman, help us understand the process, though, without getting too much in the sort of uh, congressional weeds, if you will. Yeah. When the president issues an, an executive order or a memo, Right. You guys still have a say in Congress. That's the point we tried to make at the top of the show. What's the process between what Trump says and what right. actually happens? Right. And, and as it relates to the fiduciary rule, it was, in fact, a memo, not technically an executive order. He did an executive order more broadly on Dodd-Frank, but the fiduciary rule was a memo. So the Department of Labor, I think you summarize what uh, Secretary Perez, former Secretary Perez, had to say about the rulemaking process. There is a formal process that they have to go through. But Congress also could pass a law to make changes to this uh, ruling, et cetera. And I think there's a real chance that that happens because the Republican Congress, Republican-controlled Congress, has long wanted to unwind this rule. And so there's as much of a probability that it happens through congressional action as it does through administrative action. From the standpoint of an individual investor, though, Congressman, I mean, right. uh, you know, if I read the fine print, uh, won't I understand that my financial advisor or whatever they're calling them these days may not necessarily be a fiduciary? I mean, these things are well outlined, correct, in law already. Right. So what does this rule do aside from elevating everyone who touches a retirement account to the responsibility of being a fiduciary, which may, in fact, mean cost to me as the investor? Well, look, look I don't think it necessarily means cost. Right now, the standard is suitability, right? So the standard a lot of these people are held to is whether this investment is suitable for you, right? The new standard under the fiduciary rule is it has to be in your best interest, which is obviously a higher standard. That not only gets into the quality of the investment advice, but what it really gets into is whether there's conflicts. In other words, if you want to buy an S&P 500 fund, and the firm you work for offers a product and they charge a point, but you could also buy the same product for an eighth of a point, the advisor has an obligation now under the fiduciary rule, since they're the same products and they won't offer any different investment performance, to give you the better product because that's in your best interest because the fees are lower. So it also gets, it doesn't just get at the quality of the advice, asset allocation, et cetera. It gets at some of the disclosure issues around conflicts. The critics, whether. Uh, the, I'm, I'm, finish your thought. I'm sorry, Congressman Elaine. No, I, I was, I was finished. Go ahead. No, I was uh, finished. Go ahead. The, the, the criticism, for one thing, a lot of the financial services company are long down the road towards, towards Absolutely. making the adjustments that they need to do to comply with this standard. But the criticism has been, as I believe Brian pointed out, that there would be less choice. Is right. that a red herring? Is that a, is that I just think a so. head fake here? And in what sense would there be less choice? You can put yourself so in their the, shoes. First of all, the fiduciary rule doesn't limit choice at all, right? So the, what people who are arguing against this rule are assuming is that what the industry will do is just limit choices as a way of, of uh, satisfying this rule. But in fact, if you look at what's going on, and this shouldn't be a surprise to any of us who've been in the private market. I mean, I spent my whole career in the private sector prior to running for Congress. I started two companies, took them public. I believe strongly in the private market's ability to innovate into a new situation, right? So we have a new situation with this fiduciary rule where they're changing the standards. So the better run companies, the companies that invest in technology and better products, in my opinion, will be able to meet this new standard and offer their investors a lot of choices. So this whole notion of choice being limited in the fiduciary rule is just not true. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.